You know, I initially bought Pokemon Sword with the intent to livestream it and review it as, as I would do, but halfway through the game I realized I don't understand anything. And yeah, like, a real revelation, right? But I don't understand the specifics of Pokemon that are requirements to review it. I don't know which Pokemon are missing or which are new this gen. I don't know what's different about the battle mechanics or the rebalancing. I don't know why this is the first Pokemon game where I've actually hit a level cap. I don't even really care. It, it's knowledge I don't feel like being burdened with just to tell you something you already know. There are Pokemon, and you can fight with them. Uh, to be honest, at this point, I don't even think I'm playing Pokemon for the battles. I mostly just want to see cool locations and cute animals that don't exist. Uh, maybe with a gripping narrative of becoming the very best like no one ever was thrown in to tie it all together. And I might get dissed for saying that. Okay, I've been dissed for worse things. So instead of reviewing the gameplay and having to figure out if I care about the state of the national decks, I'm just gonna talk about the story and the aesthetics, because I have a YouTube channel. And yes, I'm spoiling everything. Exits that way. Or maybe it's this way. <sighs> you know, since I have to replay the whole game to get most of this footage, I'm gonna play as a guy this time. Get some new perspective, you know? Oh look, my room is slightly different. That's fun. My original save is still super valid though, so there'll be some switches back and forth, whatever. I don't think it'll confuse anyone. For simplicity's sake, girl me is violet and boy me is violent. Let's get into it. The story starts off in the Gala region with this dude who is evil because he's a man in a Pokemon game wearing a suit although the suit is better than the alternative. And then you're introduced to Leon. No, still no. Is he wearing a cape with ads on it? This dude is the champion, undefeated, and he probably advertised Raid Shadow Legends at some point, but he's not an asshole about being the champion, so that's nice. You're also going to destroy him, and you're friends with his younger brother, Hop. <sighs> Hop. You know, you'd think the champion being your rival's older brother would lead to some decent drama, at least. I should save that for later. All you need to know about him right now is that, yes, he did use at least one of Howe's animations, but he's kind of adorable, so I'll let it slide. I'll look at them on the train, they're so cute. Anyway, you meet Leon, get your starters, and prepare yourself for disappointment at their evolutions. I could have chosen a different starter the second time around, but I stuck with Score Bunny. I find it's the lesser of three furry bait evils. Then Hop picks the starter that's your type disadvantage and is shocked when you kick his ass. So Hop's all like, bro, give us a letter of recommendation so we can do the gym challenge. <laughs> I never got any better at the accent. <laughs> and Leon's like, nah, but then he's like, okay, when Professor Magnolia tells him to do it. Yeah, this is our professor this gen. She gives you the ability to Dynamax your Pokemon. Makes them big, basically. Which means they become more powerful through the use of an ugly bracelet. Again. Also, Gigantamax, but I will discuss that nightmare later. And hey, you know how in XY and Sun Moon, the professors played a major role in the game and you saw them in a bunch of different places around the region? Yeah, you see this lady, like, three times. Instead, the Pokémon research was fobbed off onto her granddaughter, Sonia. You know, the one who had Rule 34 of her five minutes after she was first revealed? That's not a knock against her, I'm just saying. You perverts work fast, kudos. Sonia eventually becomes a professor, so I guess that's why we see her so often instead, but I think it's BS because she's not named after a plant. What kind of Pokemon professor is that? What the? What doctorate? Magnolia just put a lab coat on her and said, you're the professor now. That's not how it works. Wait, is that how it works? So since I'm judging on style here, I guess I should finally figure out which Pokemon are new and give my thoughts on them. How many are there? 81? All right, I'm not gonna get to all of them, but let's have a look. The starters are pretty cute, but their evolutions are just like twink, twunk, and hunk. Look at this guy, this yaoi hands motherfucker. As for the rest, well, to start with, let's talk about the only new Pokemon that matters, Wooloo. Yeah, I said it. 
Lulu is the face of a generation, and yes, the shiny is black. Thanks, Lady Kaneko. But the best part is, this design is so simple and nice that Wulu would look good in any color. It's really a shame they gave the freaking 60 plus color variations to this dude. Where is my rainbow Wulu, Nintendo? I want answers. Wulu is just fantastic. What does it evolve into? I, I bet it's even cuter. Oh. No. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. As for everyone else, bugs are dumb. Bird. Bird. Cool bird. Ugh. An improvement, I guess. A dog. Oh, thank god it just evolves into a dog and not furry bait. A goo. Not as pretty as they thought it was. Everybody went nuts for this thing, and I still don't know why. I kinda hate this thing. Yeah, no, that's not helping. What the hell is that? Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's cute too. Ah, you made it weird. Now it's a fetish. Oh, that's just ridiculous. Absolutely fabulous. A downgrade not worth buying shield for. A creature from your nightmares. Who the hell approved this design? It fucking step dances menacingly towards you and I, I hate it. It's a slight improvement. These ones are a weird British historical reference. I really wish they hadn't bothered. I don't like this one. And the legendaries are just kind of whatever, and Eternatus is stupid in name and design. This bone dragon is just dumb. But you know, I had these reactions a while ago. Even so, I'm glad I didn't rush this video out because we got an expansion, kids. Now listen, I didn't care about Dexit because I've never caught them all in my life, but it clearly demonstrates how much Game Freak lied their asses off about not being able to put all the Pokemon in the game because these expansions, which by the way cost a total of 30 fuck dollars, or 37, free an exchange rate, will add 200 of the old Pokemon to the Pokedex. Also Galarian Slowpoke, which, by the way, was not in the Pokedex when they added it to the game. And if you don't go get it, Nurse Killjoy will remind you of it every time you heal. I didn't go get it out of spite. Also, it's not cute that they stuck a permanent advertisement on the menu for the DLC. You're basically just advertising that the game is incomplete. Now, while I obviously won't be able to provide a great number of hot takes for whatever new Pokémon are added in these expansions, I have seen these. This one fights. Whatever. Like, actually, whatever. I don't care about this guy. And on the other hand, this Galaxy Brain Disco Deer wannabe. Just an intensely goofy design. This creature deserves every roast it gets. Look at those wobbly ass legs. That's how I used to draw legs when I was nine. Like, is this the real art? This this weird chibi thing has got to be a placeholder until the real official art gets here, right? I hate this thing. Unless the game allows me to pop this fucker like a balloon, I have no interest in this DLC. Unless I really am that desperate for new outfits. Yeah, let's talk about fashion, a topic I am clearly well versed in. At the very least, this series finally did right by me in the hair department. Look at all these styles, look at the colors, finally. Although guys can't have long hair for some reason, don't tell me it's a gender thing, Leon's a guy and you can make a sweater out of his hair. I actually had a hard time choosing a good hairstyle for Violent. And Violet too, but mostly because I can't see what the hair will look like on my character, an actual preview with my outfit and eyes would be nice. Because yes, you can change your eye color too, and I'm liking all these options. They got... oh my god. Hard eyes, motherfucker! Oh yes, that's fantastic. Sadly, male characters also don't get as many options for this, like different eyelashes and lipstick. Which, you know, is more of a societal issue, and Game Freak isn't exactly known for breaking boundaries. Still, though, I'd say 10 out of 10 eye customization. Or should I say, 20 out of 20. <laughs> Unfortunately, in contrast, I found the clothing options a bit weak. I don't think I could dress like a goth if I tried. Managed a half-decent e-boy, though. The selection is pretty bland, and I see those shorts. You wouldn't need those if you made the skirts slightly longer. Now every skirt is a skort, and 
I'm not a fan. The male clothes aren't much better, in fact, I'd say they're way worse, but at least I was able to wear pants from the start. All the gloves look bad, you can't wear hats with certain hairstyles, and every backpack is gigantic and ugly. God, I'd kill for a Pokemon-shaped bag. Why is Pokemon Go doing a better job at this? And I know I'm gonna get hate mail for this, but... I don't care for plaid, and there's way too much of it. Fashion is like... a 6 out of 10. And the gym challenge makes it a 1 out of 10. So, because the Gala region is based on the UK, Pokemon battles are basically the replacement for football. So, when you fight gym battles, you gotta wear this soccer uniform. You get to pick your own number for it, too. I bet you can all guess what I picked. I picked 13 because I'm not a degenerate. I see all you 69s and 420s out there. I don't have anything to say about it, I just... I see you guys. Also, if you have long hair, you can't see your number. Fantastic. Anyway, you're stuck with this lame, basic bitch uniform. You can buy different themed uniforms, a ghost being a personal favorite. Doesn't matter, you can't wear it in a gym. The reason for this is never explained, like, why would you make a thing out of having uniform shops in the gyms, but not allow different uniforms during the actual gym battles? Speaking of gyms, the gym leaders are mostly cool. I mean, Nessa is fabulous, Milo is a cutie, Raihan is... tall. Gordy looks like Ronaldo, though. These gym dudes are perfectly fine, but something I desperately hope doesn't become a permanent thing for the series going forward is version-exclusive gyms. Because, well, first of all, it's fucking stupid, but also, it leads to the story feeling lesser, or that could just be the lazy way they were handled. For the gyms that are in both games, you typically meet the gym leaders beforehand, and they get to be real characters in the story. For the exclusives, you just don't see them outside of gyms. Ever. Because that would require effort. They can't be involved with the actual plot because there would need to be a lot of rewriting to work them into both versions in different ways. Like, really, there's not even a cutscene of them interacting with the player outside of a gym. So they basically just exist as people to fight and... nothing more. I don't jive with this, and it makes me glad I didn't buy S.H.I.E.L.D. just for Alistair because he looked cool. Goth energy can only take you so far, how about you have a purpose outside of wearing a spooky mask? It kind of feels like they wanted to actually have ten gyms, but they didn't have enough time to make another two towns for them, so they just split the least story-relevant gym leaders between the two versions. I obviously have no proof of this, but comparing the different versions does give me that impression. Like, it's pretty clear the fighting gym and the ice gym look right at home in their respective towns, what with the color schemes clearly matching the area around them. On the other hand, the rock gym and especially the ghost gym look like they belong somewhere else. And besides having to change up your strategy to fight these gyms, the only difference is aesthetics. The gyms are literally the same thing, with different skins. I'm actually kind of amazed I didn't see anyone call this out. It's kind of pathetic. All that being said, I genuinely enjoyed the gym battles. Not the gyms themselves, seriously. Your gym is in the middle of a mystical forest of glowing mushrooms, and this is what you went with? You're the worst, Opal. But these big final battles, you could say, are rad as hell. The crowd cheering, the music, god what a banger, the atmosphere. These battles are just fun to experience. I love them. These battles also show off Gigantamaxing, and that's... yeah, let's look at these. So most Pokémon, you Dynamax, they big, that's all there is to it. But some Pokémon are able to Gigantamax, which is the same, but now they look... different? Sometimes worse. They might be stronger than regular Dynamax, but I'm not looking that up. I mean, some of these are fine, like Charizard is whatever, he's just more on fire, how original. Pikachu got his chonk back, Meowth is long cat, Machamp finally put some pants on, Eevee maxed out on Fluff, uh, this one's a big cake. These are fine. A few just look silly, like Snake Nato and the Ladybug Mothership, while others are straight up terrifying. Like, I'm sorry, but did Garbodor Katamari the fucking Titanic? Grimmsnarl makes me incredibly uncomfortable. Good lord, Kingler, you know, Lovecraft was wrong about a lot of things, but yeah, he had a point. The ocean is a horrible place. Also, this one's just... a building. 
No, that's stupid. Go back and try again. Why did this design get approved? But Gigantamax isn't the only terrifying thing. There's also... the field? They call it the wild area, but, you know, it's a field. Why is the field terrifying? The Pokémon are here. I mean, they were here. But now they're here. And they're to size. Also, I didn't know that the big ones were really strong, so I just walked up on this dude thinking everything would be okay, and... No. But that's not all you should fear. If you turn on online services, this field is full of ghosts. I think the only way this could be more unsettling is if this area was PvP-enabled. Doesn't help that this game has the draw distance of a foggy morning, so everything just pops up in a fashion I can only describe as... menacing. You know how ghost girls are a recurring thing in Pokémon? Well, we finally have the technology to make everyone a ghost girl. Except for this one part at the beginning? Could I get some consistency, please? Gotta be honest, I both love and hate this place. I mean, it's really cool that you can see wild Pokémon just running around in the grass and- Oh, Jesus! And the raids are, uh, something. Well, at the very least, they show off your character emoting. That's a welcome change from Sun Moon's creepy, constant smile. Other than that, though, there's not much to look at here besides the giant murder beast. There's this thing. I don't know what it's for, there's nothing else like it. Aesthetically, this field is a mess. The weather shifts all over the place, and the fastest way to traverse it is on a bike. Which wouldn't be a problem if you didn't look like this. Oh yeah, you can change the color, but what's the point? All that careful thought I put into my outfit was laid to waste because I just wanted to get somewhere slightly faster. <sighs> that seems to be a running theme here. Waste. There's a lot of waste of potential exploration-wise in Sword and Shield. You know how XY was based on France and they had a fake Eiffel Tower with a gym inside because that's a famous French landmark and exploring a version of it in the Pokémon universe is just a cool idea? So what sorts of famous UK landmarks should be in this game? I guess this is like fake Stonehenge? That's cool. What else? Big Ben? Maybe that giant Ferris wheel thing? Oh, there they are. Cool, maybe Big Ben is a gym with a clockwork theme. Oh, the closest thing we get to that is a fancy elevator? <sighs> okay, well, what about the Ferris wheel? Remember in black and white when you got to go on a date with Anne on a Ferris wheel? Don't at me, it was totally a date. That was pretty cool. Uh, maybe we can go there with Hop, or some bad guys will shut it down and we'll have to beat them before we can ride it. What's that? It's just a part of the background and you never go there? Like... Actually, how dare you? Look at it, it's lighting up in different colors, looking cool as hell, and no one even talks about it! There's also Hammerlock. Like, check this out, it's an absolutely radical castle. Look at those things coming off of it, this is gonna be so cool to explore. What's that? All the possible entrances to places of interest are gated off? Why are you showing me an epic castle I can barely explore? This baffles me. Why are you lock why are you closing your doors? Why are you locking your doors to the public? Why? Tell us the reason why It's not just the big things like that, it's the little things too. See, there's this lighthouse. The door is blocked off with a rope. Is there a way to unlock it? Is it post-game content or something? Nah. You never get to enter this lighthouse! You know, you could've just not put a door on it rather than taunt me with dreams of lighthouse exploration. Like, they clearly put a staircase up to that door and just lazily blocked it off. Like, there had to have been something to this, right? And there's this room in Winden Stadium that this guy stops you from entering for no reason? I just want to use the vending machine, Dave! I can't even check out the backside of Rose Tower! Who put all this shit here? There's also this building. A mildly impressive looking building, wouldn't you say? Maybe it's some kind of museum or something. A museum would be cool, right? It's a one-room uniform shop. Yeah, a uniform shop. You know, that thing you can find at almost every gym? I could go on forever with examples, but I'll stop there. All exploration is exclusive to this friggin' field. And why can't I look in trash cans for stuff anymore? Screw this, let's just enjoy the story.
the characters. I've got my first Pokemon, I'm about to take on Galar's Gym Challenge, and maybe even defeat the champion if I train hard enough. Plus, I've got my good friend Hop by my side along the way. Yeah, now's a good time to talk about Hop. Hop is an unfortunate character. In theory, he's got a good setup for some development. His brother is the undefeated champion, and as much as it doesn't seem to bother him, he's definitely living in Leon's shadow. It's pretty obvious that Leon is the favorite. The living room in Hop's house is dominated by Leon's trophies and awards and photos of him. In comparison, there is not a single photo of Hop anywhere in this house. This is now a call-out post for Hop's entire family. Why are you ignoring this child's existence? You're gonna give him a complex. Anyway, it makes sense for Hop's goal to be defeating his brother and becoming the new champion. That's a typical anime protagonist kind of goal. Only problem is, Hop isn't the protagonist. He's your rival, and he has to lose. Now, that isn't exactly a bad thing either. Not every character gets to successfully reach their goals. Hop losing isn't the important part here. It's how he reacts to the loss. Losses can motivate a person to improve, or it can make them bitter. Hop's main goal is to defeat his brother and become the new champion. And here is the player character beating him at every turn, shoving it in his face that they'll be the next champion not him. I was kind of assuming, well, or hoping really, that the accumulated losses would make Hop eventually snap and become an antagonist of sorts. He would just get so frustrated that over the course of the game, his friendly rivalry with you would change to anger at you. But that doesn't happen. At one point, he gets defeated in battle by a fellow challenger and gets depressed, thinking he's ruined his brother's image by being a failure. I thought that would be the tipping point instead. Oh, maybe he goes off the rails and starts training his Pokémon too hard. At some point, he starts switching up his team with almost entirely new Pokémon, so what if swapping out his team so carelessly is actually making his battling worse? Or, what if his team is different because he started stealing other trainers' stronger Pokémon to get the upper hand in the gym challenge? Nobody would have seen that coming. But no, nothing like that happens. Nothing that would be interesting or maybe provide character development. He gets over his issues off-screen and loses another battle to you, but says he's fine now. He kind of sucks as a trainer, but the one legendary takes pity on him and joins his team, so he feels a bit better about himself. Although he did make it to the semi-finals, so maybe everyone in Galar just sucks at battling. And all it leads up to is Hop deciding, in the post-game epilogue by the way, that if he can't be the new champion, he wants to be a Pokémon professor, which not only comes out of nowhere, but also showcases the serious lack of career options for Pokémon trainers. Like really, if you do the gym challenge and you don't defeat the champion, what do you do? Just give up on battling competitively forever and go work a regular job? Actually, yeah, I guess that is what they do. Anyway, Hop is cute, but his character was wasted. He should have gone rogue, if only for Bede to have a real effect on the story. Oh yeah, Bede battled him, he's a bad guy, I guess. He works for Rose, but Rose forgets who he is, even though he approved him to join the gym challenge. I don't know, his character arc is dumb. He's like a tsundere, but not endearing. He also does not look good in pastels. What were you thinking, Opal? But what about the actual villains? The villain team. The teams we faced in Pokémon have varied in threat level over the years. Sometimes they wanted to exploit Pokémon for profit, sometimes they wanted to change the world in devastating ways. Then in Sun Moon, Team Skull was kind of a subversion of the typical evil team, as they didn't really have an overall goal and weren't much of a threat because it was a gang made up of trainers that failed the island challenge. They weren't really villains, they were a group of misfit losers that just liked to cause trouble, and I thought they were delightful. And then the Aether Foundation was kind of like the real evil team, but whatever. Team Skull was pretty cool. Also, Guzma could get it. And I suspect the devs wanted to make something similar for Sword and Shield. And what they came up with was Team Yell. Starting with the name. No, like, come on, that's the best you got. They're based on punks. Call them Team Spike or something. Whatever. Anyway, their main purpose seems to be disrupting the peace and getting in the way of trainers doing the gym challenge. So they're a fair bit like Team Skull, except they aren't being disruptive for the sake of it. They're doing it for Marnie, 
Who's Marnie? She's another trainer doing the gym challenge. You fight her a few times, but she's overall not that important and, honestly, not that interesting of a character. And Team Yell is her fan club. That's it, they want Marnie to win the gym challenge so they get in all the other challengers' way. And Marnie didn't ask them to do that. She doesn't even really seem to like them. Then it's revealed that Team Yell is comprised entirely of gym trainers from Marnie's hometown, Spikemuth, and they shut down the whole town just to stop people from finishing the gym challenge. Which has gotta be against some kind of rule, but I will let that slide to tell you how much of a letdown Spikemuth is. Remember how Team Skull took over Po Town and it was dark and raining, the place was covered in graffiti, the buildings were wrecked, and even the Pokemon Center was vandalized and you had to pay to heal your Pokemon? That was pretty cool. Anyway, Spike Muth is a hallway. It's got a Mr. Mime. Maybe the devs thought the lameness of this hallway could be excused by what's at the end of it. Say hello to Guzma's new competition slash dude to ship him with, Piers. Piers is Marnie's older brother. Piers can't Dynamax his Pokemon. Piers makes me wish the game had voice acting so I could actually hear him singing. Piers found out Leon was late for going out to dinner with me and Hop, and immediately proceeded to start a riot in a train station. Piers is my favorite character. But more importantly, Leon ditched us. Why? Well, it's a story thing, and I haven't really talked about the story because I don't really get it. Not in like a, oh, it's really smart and complicated, so I'm gonna need an hour-long analysis video to understand it kind of way. It's more of a, wait, what, why? kind of way. Basic story is understandable. We're doing the gym challenge and facing all the obstacles that come with that. There's a side plot of Sonya doing research to learn about Galar's history and this event called The Darkest Day where a bunch of Pokemon Dynamax but Naruto and Sasuke save the day. Also, dogs. Okay? Still on board. But then there's the villain's evil plan. So of course, you have to defeat some sort of villain in a Pokemon game. The big bad is Chairman Rose. I know, nobody saw that coming. He's in charge of energy plants or something. And no, his evil plan isn't global warming. He wants to provide Galar with more energy for the future by reenacting the darkest day. He gets Bead to collect Wishing Stars, the power source of the Dynamax bracelets, and he eventually gets enough of them and he's going to enact his plan on the day of the championship match. For some reason, kind of seems like he could have done this at any time. He specifically says Galar will run out of energy a thousand years from now. There's not a real rush to do this. Also, why is this one specific cutscene a slideshow? Did they run out of time? So he needed Leon to help him. He called him to a meeting, that's why he missed dinner. But Leon was like, I got a battle, dude. So Rose said screw it and did it anyway, interrupting the championship battle by summoning this Yu-Gi-Oh monster using the Wishing Stars. He wanted to harness its power for Galar, but he couldn't control it and basically screwed everyone over when all the Pokemon and Hammerlock started Dynamaxing. So that sucks, but you might be able to defeat it by calling upon the heroes of legend. These very large dogs, who are supposed to be Galar's protectors, but they don't actually show up unless you take their sword and shield. I mean, if you step on their turf, they do some weird hologram shit, but it's the property theft that really gets them off the couch. So you beat Rose, you take down the Bone Daddy, and Rose gets arrested. Sure hope that goes well. Then you beat Leon and become the new champion. And before you ask, no, you don't get the cape. Look, he threw it away, finders keepers. Now I get to be Galar's biggest sellout. And yeah, that's the story. Sure, you won, but that was kind of lame. Also, the whole legendary battle felt tacked on as hell. Like, dude, you're not even on the box, get out. Actually, wait, what about the real legendary? Because despite our whole dogs versus Slifer the executive producer fight, I didn't even get to catch the sword dog. What gives, huh? Oh, the post game. Right. I'm gonna be real, the post game has a better story than the main game and I'm not even kidding. These two fashion disasters show up, claim to be descendants of Naruto and Sasuke, steal the sword and shield, well, okay, only the shield, damn it, Hop, and run around making Pokemon Dynamax. I don't really know why they did this, just to prove that the legendaries suck, and also they're famous so they can do what they want. It might be a criticism of celebrity culture, but if so, it's very confused. 
Less confused than Rose's whole plan, though. Also, Sonia's randy-ass lab assistant, who doesn't even get a name, turning out to have been working for the bad guys all along, was the best plot twist in the entire game. I'm not saying it's a good plot twist, it was just the best one this game had. Anyway, you fight the shield dog, but can't catch it, lovely. Then you fight the sword dog, which you can catch, have a heart attack when you accidentally kill it, then realize legendaries can't die anymore, catch it, and then these idiots either go to jail or get bailed out by the Jake Paul fandom, whatever. The game's over. Also, Leon dresses like an even bigger loser now. Overall, this game is highly roastable, which isn't a good look. Pretty weak sauce for the big new Pokemon game on Switch. If I could describe it in a single word, it would be undercooked. Feels like they slashed whatever exploration there could have been in various locations for the field. And the story is just about pointless with mostly flat characters. And the old starters got the boot, but they kept fucking Garbodor. You know what? Actually, Fuck Dexit. This is the product of hubris. This franchise can get away with anything because it's so insanely profitable. Like, I'm not saying this is a bad game, I did have fun with it, but was it really good enough to surpass Smash Ultimate as the fastest selling game for Switch? So yeah, on an aesthetic and story level, not a fan. Other than that, it is a Pokemon game. And that's really the most I can say about it. Also, what the fuck was with the ball guy?